you have no spare parts. The problem with the modern or traditional, actually I shouldn't say modern, the problem with medicine as a whole is it has compartmentalized the human body so much that it's lost the big picture. That's why I see streams of people coming into my office diagnosed with everything under the sun and they haven't gotten any help. One of the reasons they haven't gotten help is the prevailing attitude. And part of the prevailing attitude in a microcosm is, is this idea that you don't need your spleen, you can get by without that. You don't need your gallbladder, you can get by without that. Oh, and you don't really need your appendix. Well, newsflash, you do need your appendix. Some great research was just done. And what they basically found is that the appendix actually can be a little reservoir for the good bacteria that live in your intestines that it can release when it needs to, such as in cases of diarrhea or infection or something like that. So let me give you a scenario, and I don't think any research has been done on this, but people that have ulcerative colitis, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, Crohn's disease, those types of things, I wonder how many of those people have had their appendix out. I would like to see what, those, uh, what the results would be of a study like that. I think this has big implications, not only just from a, you know, a cultural mindset standpoint, from a real uh, impact. I, mean, I see a lot of people with autoimmune conditions and one of the things that these people often have is intestinal inflammation and many of these people if you go back and look at their history what did they have? They had some sort of gut infection, they had a parasite some of them still have these things and don't have any idea that that's what they have. Now the appendix obviously plays a role in this and then maybe what's happened with some of these people is their appendix is failing on them or maybe they had their appendix out and now they don't have that reserve. It's kind of like the spleen. The thing I said about the spleen, the spleen is a reservoir for immune cells that it can dump into your system when you need them. If you don't have appendix, you have a decreased ability to respond to something. Now the, the textbooks, in fact the study was cool, it said that perhaps the textbooks ought to be changed. Uh, when Darwin first looked at the appendix, he thought it was a vestigial organ and all these other things. What we know now is is that every single part of your body has a role to play in order to keep you healthy and especially when you've deviated from health and you become sick. It's true you can live without your appendix, but you're going to have a greater chance of quite a few diseases. Just because you can live without something doesn't mean you don't need it. You can live without both your legs and both your arms and both your eyes. It doesn't prove you don't need it. This textbook shows the coccyx, the human tailbone, in a Discover magazine, and it says, that's all that's left of the tail that most mammals still use. Humans have a tailbone that is of no apparent use. I was in a debate in Huntsville, Alabama, against the president of the North Alabama Atheist Association. He got up in front of God and everybody and said, folks, I've got proof for evolution. Humans have a tailbone they no longer need. I said, uh, Mr. Patterson, I taught biology and anatomy. I happen to know there are nine little muscles that attach to the tailbone, <clears throat> without which you cannot perform some valuable functions. I won't tell you what they all are, but trust me, you need those muscles. I said, now, if you think the tailbone is vestigial, I, Kent Hovind, will pay to have yours removed. <laughs> Bend over. <clears throat> Critical thinking, this book says, 2005 edition. At the end of your backbone is a coccyx, a few small bones that are fused together. Could the human coccyx be a vestigial structure? Or is it the start of a newly evolving structure? That's thinking critically. They give the kids two answers, two options, both of which are wrong. There's a third option, you know. Maybe it's fine just like it is. Notice they don't give that as an option, do they? Maybe it was designed to support your colon and support your lower back for posture when you sit and five or six other things you can read your Gray's Anatomy about, okay? They say, aren't babies born with tails once in a while? No. Well, that baby's got a tail right there. No, he doesn't. It's not a tail. That's just fatty tissue. There's no bone, no muscle, no cartilage. It's not even lined up with the spine. It has to do with the way the baby develops inside the mother. There's fat around the nervous system to protect it until the bone grows around it. And extremely, generally, the, the fat is resorbed into the system as the baby grows and develops bone. But on extremely rare occasions, the fat is excluded outside the body like a big wart. So what you do, you cut it off, sew it up, put a diaper on the kid, and send him home. It's just nothing like a, it's just like a wart. That's all it is. Cut it off. It's not a tail. This one says the coccyx 
is a small bone at the end of the human vertebral column. It has no present function. And it's thought to be the remainder of bones that once occupied the long tail of a tree-living ancestor. They told me when I was a kid, man used to have a tail, but he lost it because he didn't need it. I thought, didn't need it? Have you ever thought how handy a tail would be? Have you ever come to the door with two sacks of groceries? Man, wouldn't that be nice to be able to grab that door and walk right in there? You could drive down the highway and hold that can of Coke and tune the radio knob all at the same time. <laughs> Lost it because we didn't need it. That's a lie. Everything used as evidence for evolution has been proven wrong. Charles Darwin said, to suppose that the eye could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd. But then he goes on for three or four pages and says how he thinks it happened anyway. Your eyeball is amazing. You know, at the back of your eye, there are 137 million light-sensitive cells in one square inch, called your retina, all of them wired straight to the brain. How would you like to hook up 137 million electrical connections in one square inch? My Heavenly Father did. He's pretty smart, isn't he? Now, I debated one atheist one time, and he said, Hoven, the eye is an example for evolution because it's poorly designed. I said, what on earth are you talking about? He said, well, the light comes into your eye, and then it goes through blood vessels in front of the retina. He said, that's wired backwards. He said, the octopus has a much better eye because their blood vessels are behind the retina. I said, sir... Let me just explain something to you, okay? I said, we live in the air. <clears throat> now, air is a pretty poor insulator for UV light. So your body has, is designed with the blood vessels in front of the retina. That's your body's last defense against ultraviolet light. Now, octopus live in the water, okay? Water blocks UV light. So they don't need their blood vessels in front. See, we're designed for living in air, and they're designed for living in water. Now, if you want to swap eyes with an octopus, you just go ahead, sir, but you're going to be blind in a few days, okay? Because they don't have the blood vessels in front to block the UV light. What a dumb evidence for evolution. What they're trying to say is, well, God wouldn't do it this way, so it must have evolved. Well, that's a silly argument for evolution. Maybe you just don't understand why it was designed that way. I think man's understanding of the human body... It's about like putting a five-year-old kid under the hood of your car and saying, hey, kid, take out whatever this thing doesn't need. <laughs> you don't know what any of it does. You can take it all out, right? You know, your eyeball is amazing. It would take a minimum of 100 years of cray computer time to simulate what takes place in your eye many times every second. Eyeballs are amazing. But this textbook says, the complex structure of the human eye may be the product of millions of years of evolution. Why doesn't God get the glory for what he did? This textbook shows the kids a bird eye and a reptile eye, and it says right up here, boys and girls, you can better understand how the eye might have evolved if you picture a series of changes. You have to imagine how it happened. Just imagine the eye changing. That's not science, <laughs> imagining how it happened. Where's the evidence? See, evolution only takes place in the imagination never takes place in reality. The imperfections are very re revealing because they're exactly the kind of imperfections you'd expect from the accidents of history if there were no designer. There's a nerve called the recurrent laryngeal which runs from the brain and its end organ is the larynx and you think it would just go straight there but in a human what it does is goes down into the chest, loops around one of the main arteries in the chest and then goes straight back up again. Obviously a ridiculous detour. No engineer would ever make a mistake like that.
This one tells the kids the whale has a vestigial pelvis. It says many organisms retain traces of their evolutionary history. For example, the whale retains pelvic and leg bones as useless vestiges. What's this talking about? The National Center for Science Education, all four of them working in this little storefront building, call themselves the National Center, you know, big name, little bitty building right there on, in Berkeley, California. They say bossy, the cow, evolved to the whale. Really? Wow. I debated Jeannie Scott on the radio for 30 minutes. I got to speak for three of the 30 minutes. I'll be glad to debate her again anytime. She won't do it anymore. But Andrew Carnegie started this group that she's the president of purposely to keep evolution out of schools. That's why they exist. But the cow did not evolve to the whale. This textbook says, the whale has a pelvis that has no purpose. Hmm. They have hind limb bones that have no function. Holt Biology 2001. Just imagine whales walking around. It's true. What are they talking about? They're talking about those little tiny bones right there. Just imagine the whale walking around. <laughs> you know, I tried, and I can't imagine. It says the whale's pelvis has no function. Hmm. The whale's pelvis is evidence of its four-legged, having a four-legged land-dwelling mammal as an ancestor. Oh, come on, this is a lie. Those little bones are part of the whale's reproductive system. Whales are pretty big, you know. That supports different muscles. The whales cannot reproduce without those little bones. It has nothing to do with walking on land. It has to do with getting baby whales. So the guys that are writing this are real, real ignorant about whale anatomy, or they're lying to your kids trying to make them believe a theory. There are no vestigial organs, and if there were, that would be the opposite of evolution. The whale did not evolve from any kind of other animal. It developed, descended from the first whale that God made. We have in our museum a 15 and a half foot python snake skin. Way down near the south end of that snake, you'll see little tiny claws. There they are, right there, little bitty claws with a little bone inside. Now look what this textbook says. Snakes have rudimentary hind legs. Uh, excuse me, those are not hind legs. Those little claws are used during mating. Snakes don't have any arms, you know. And they can't talk and say, screw it over, honey, okay? It's got nothing to do with walking on land, okay? This has to do with getting baby snakes. Now these guys ought to quit lying to the kids.